Hello, it's Mark here from Yokel Bear Reads. Um, and today is going to be one of my occasional series um, entitled The Books That Made Me. Books that have had a big influence on me. And today it's not a particular author, not a particular book, but more of a, a genre, I guess. But it's a genre that isn't around as much anymore. But when I was a kid, and certainly a teenager, this was a real quite big thing. Because I grew up in the 70s and early 80s, and there was a lot of spooky stuff written about. Um, and what I mean is, is things like the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, um, UFOs, stuff like that. There was a big resurgence of kind of interest in that stuff. And being the kind of child that would... I just believed everything. Um... So I got really caught up in it. I was I was borderline obsessed with kind of the unexplained and mysteries and strange creatures and stuff like that. So I, I bought lots of books at the time. And so the kind of books that really influenced me, and here's some of them that I've still got. This one, these are all from the early early to um to late 70s, maybe early 80s. I mean, like this one, um, Bigfoot, the Yeti Sasquatch in Myth and Reality. Um, and I just loved it because, look, you could see the Yeti footprints and, and as far as I was concerned, that was proof. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's on there, definitely exists. Um, and a couple others here that I've, I seem to have hung on to. Um, the Loch Ness Story by Nicholas Witchell. Now, British viewers will, might recognise <laughs> Nicholas Witchell's now a newsreader. I think he's the BBC Royal correspondent now. But when he was younger, he actually went and lived by Loch Ness for a while and investigated the Loch Ness monster and wrote this book. And also as well, um, Tim Dinsdale's um, The Loch Ness Monster. Tim Din Dinsdale became famous because he actually got some footage of reputedly the, the Loch Ness monster. Um, quite controversial footage in a way. Um, it's divided a lot of opinion over the years. Um, now... I'm not really going to review these books as such because I don't think they're, I don't think they're in print anymore. I don't think anybody can go and get copies of these. But I'm going to review some books about a similar, you know, similar things that have come out recently. Now, the one thing I will say is that over the years I've become far more of a skeptic. Um, like for instance, um, when I was a teenager, I absolutely implicitly believed in the Loch Ness monster. Because it was such a romantic thing that there was this big creature that no one knew about and it really fired my imagination. But then I kind of discovered science. And I love science. I absolutely love science. I love everything about science and it really interests me. But it made me see that there were certain flaws in the argument for the Loch Ness Monster. Not least the fact that you can't just have one. Unless this creature has lived for thousands of years, you have to have a population. And to have a population, you need a minimum of at least about 50, possibly 100. Which means if there is a population of unknown, huge, great, big, 50-foot-long creatures in Loch Ness, and you need about 50 of them, you couldn't move with that without seeing them. You would see them all the time. And we don't. And also, as well, um, in the early 80s, I think, they did this big thing where they did uh, a whole um, sonar scan of the lock with a line of boats across the lock. And they found nothing. And there's no way that, and no way that, you know, they if it was in there, they would have found it that way. And, of course, then all kinds of other things crop up out with their tunnels and caves. and But I don't know. I think, you know, I began to not believe... Uh, so, my first book that I'm going to review, even though this is kind of the books that made me, this is kind of the books that made me next. It's the more sceptical look at um, some of this stuff. And this was a great book that came out a couple of years ago, which is by Gareth Williams, A Monstrous Commotion, The Mysteries of Loch Ness. I absolutely love this book because it takes you from start to right up to today about what's going on with, you know, the whole thing with the Loch Ness Monster. And it looks at it from all different angles. Um, 
why people believe it, where, how kind of stories go around. There's also a huge, great big part of this, which is about the role of the media and how the media can really kind of play up stories um, that then get in the press and it just kind of continues the myth. Um, he also digs up some really interesting stuff, like, for instance, the scientist who was fired from his job at the Natural History Museum for going to search for the monster. And there's a load of stuff in here about the kind of tension between established science and people who are from the science field but kind of believe in the Loch Ness Monster. And that was really interesting. The other thing as well, there's a brilliant bit in here about where a guy called Sir Peter Scott got involved um, who was a, like a famous um, naturalist and presenter. And there was all kinds of things about him getting so involved that he tried to get a law passed through Parliament to protect the Loch Ness Monster, um, despite the fact there was no evidence it existed. They even gave it like a Latin name, even though there was no evidence it existed. And at some point, the Queen got involved as well. Um, he wrote to the Queen saying, I'd like to name the Loch Ness Monster after you. Um, which, I don't know, if I was the Queen, I'd be a bit insulted. I mean, look. Don't know. So, but the other thing that I love about this book is that he comes to a conclusion. And it's a very subtle conclusion. It's not like a big revelation at the end. It's just built layer on layer on layer. And I'm not going to give it away because I think you should, if you're interested in this, you should go and read it. But let's, let me just say that the... The mystery can be explained not through all the photographs and the eyewitness things. It can be explained by the presence of a particular person all the way through this. And that's all I'm going to say. It's a book. This is, this is a, a YouTube video about mysteries. Of course, I'm going to leave some mysteries. So, yeah, this is a great read. Also, there's loads of stuff about geology and kind of you know the highland scotland it's just a great book it reads like a kind of novel so anyway so that's that's a lot less monster well the other thing that i was really interested in was the yeti and bigfoot now here's the thing with bigfoot maybe not so much the yeti there's actually some good evidence that's come out recently that might suggest that the Yeti is actually misidentified bears that live at a higher altitude in Nepal and place like that. But if I was going to lay some money, if I was a betting man, if I was going to say, if I, if I had to put a bet on one of these things existing, the Loch Ness Monster, UFOs, stuff like that, I'd put it on Bigfoot, actually. Because when you think of like the Pacific Northwest and the other places, these are vast, unexplored places that we've never been to and I think there's some really good evidence as well certainly stronger evidence than there is for the Loch Ness Monster um, and recently and this I didn't know this book was coming out this was I popped into a bookshop and bang there it was so I had to get it which is um, by Graham Hoyland and it's called Yeti an abominable history um, again with this book it kind of, it's the similar kind of um, similar one to a monstrous commotion, similar layout in that it takes you through the history of the kind of sightings and where the legend of the Yeti comes from. And it does actually go into kind of towards the end, it starts straying into, well, what's the connection with Bigfoot here? Are these the same things? Are these the same creatures? One thing that this book is absolutely great with, it, it's also about, um, not just about the Yeti, it's also about the kind of golden years of mountaineering, when, you know, these days mountaineering can be very much a kind of established industry. You saw those things where people queue to get to the top of Everest now, so many people are climbing it. But this was in the days when it was like real pioneer um, mountaineers were breaking new ground and climbing mountains that hadn't been climbed before so there's a lot of that in there about the characters of the those mountaineers and you know who were also apparently eyewitnesses to yetis or saw the footprints or what have you but again in here this is this takes quite a skeptical view in that there's quite a few of the famous 
pictures and sightings that actually you can you can deconstruct and say actually that's probably fake or yeah they definitely misidentified something now but again it's it's a great read it we, i raced through it because it was just so interesting it didn't really come to any conclusion at the end there wasn't a definite kind of oh the yeti doesn't exist it was more just look there's no point having absolute belief you have to look at each case and you have to look at the evidence which is where i'm at now which is that you know i would love i mean could you imagine if there was proof of bigfoot or the yeti it would kind of change so much about science and everything like that but for me the, the key word is proof there has to be proof and i don't mean just a blurry photograph or somebody saw something in the dim twilight one night out in on the mountain or um in the forest or whatever um it's got to be, you know, basically you need a specimen or you need incontrovertible footage. You need a DNA sample and maybe we'll get that one day. But I do love the idea that there's still this big mystery out there that maybe it could exist. And that kind of links back to the books that made me when I was younger, because that's what it was about. It wasn't about the absolute belief. It was just about the possibilities of that there could be something that we don't know, something left to be discovered. Um, and a real sense of that comes through this book. And the last one I'm going to say, because that's mainly about the Yeti, but if I was going to say a book that's come out fairly recently that covers a lot of stuff about Bigfoot, which would be this one. This is Daniel Loxton and Donald R. Prothero's Abominable Science, The Origins of the Yeti, Nessie and Other Famous Cryptids. I love the cover to this. Love that old 1950s comic book kind of font. Love that. Um, and again, this is this is from a really ultimate skeptics view. These are um, people, scientists who actually kind of look at the reality behind this. And it's actually kind of like, for instance, I love these chapter beginnings. Look, there you go. There's Bigfoot there. Um, and... Again, I think it debunks a lot of stuff. But for me, reading the bit about Bigfoot in here, there's still a sliver of doubt. I think it's possible. And certainly I know people from Canada or the States that have kind of had sightings or strange things happen that could be explained by a large ape-like creature um, living in the wilds. And also as well, just what's really clear from this book is how wild this place is. I mean, these are, there are some places in the Pacific Northwest where, like, nobody's been to. They're just so remote and so unable to get to. So there, there is kind of space. I think with Loch Ness, the problem is you've only got a finite amount of water. Yeah, it's 26 miles long. When you're talking about the Pacific Northwest, you're talking about millions of square kilometres. Um, so... You know, I think maybe. The other thing is, and just a, a brief mention, like a runner-up of in the cryptid stake, another one of my favourites is something called the Macaulay Mbembe, um, which is apparently a surviving dinosaur living in the Congo, um, which I quite, you know, I love dinosaurs, so the thought that there might still be one out there, you know, that's great. But again, with this, I think they pretty much debunk the fact that this could and it's misidentifications of existing animals and stuff like that but it is a great read and also as well the thing i love about this book is the early part of this book actually gives you a real crash course on skeptical and critical thinking about how to actually apply a scientific method to these things and i think that's great that's really really great so the books that made me when i was younger are the kind of pulpy Oh my God, the Loch Ness Monster exists stuff. But the books that have continued to make me are books like this, which is revisiting my childhood passions, but in a more sceptical scientific way. So there you go. I don't know. Do you think Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, all these things could exist? Do you believe in UFOs? Why not comment down below and tell me? Um, also as well if you like what you've seen here in the video um, if you want to subscribe 
and press the little bell thing you'll know when I publish videos which hasn't been as often because I've been really busy at work luckily August is far less busy so I am going to be recording some more booktube videos and I have been reading quite a lot of books say so that's me done right I'm off to look for Bigfoot well no I'm just off to drink my tea actually but I sure talk to you soon bye